before we went to court, we recognized that win or lose, we were going to continue to defend our rights to our lands and resources. And so through our uh, visioning of what we want to see and what we want to leave for our children, through our continued practice and continued building of our relationship to each other and to our land, we continue to say as Amaya people that the land is important for us and we hope that the government of Belize will do good to this judgment that has been very historic, not just for the Maya people, but for indigenous people globally. Hello, welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, Season 2, Global Ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the big questions in the field of global environmental politics. I'm Peter Andre from Carleton University. My co-host for the show is Dr. Ryan katz from the University of Ottawa, though Ryan's not joining us for this episode. Today, we're traveling to the biodiverse forests of Southern Belize in Central America to talk with two Indigenous activists and educators about the relationship between Indigenous rights and environmental conservation in their country, and how this links with global efforts to strengthen Indigenous rights and build North-South relationships. The country we now know as Belize has a rich history that goes back thousands of years. Between about 1500 BCE and 1000 of the Common Era, there were a number of de densely populated and technologically advanced Mayan cities in the country now known as Belize. The first incursions by Europeans came with the Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century. In the 19th century, the country was named a British colony, originally British Honduras, that country only gained formal independence from Britain in 1981. Over this long colonial period from the 16th century to the present day, the indigenous Maya people of Belize continued to live and move across their traditional lands in what are now Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize. But state recognition of Maya governance of the territories they lived on, at least in Belize, was never formalized. In recent decades, there have been many incidents that revealed a conflict between the traditional governance of these lands by community leaders, known as alcaldes in the uh, Mopan and Kekchi communities in the south of Belize, and the nation state of Belize. For example, the state would grant permits to explore for oil or to cut trees without the consent of the traditional leaders of the communities on whose territories these actions would take place. Starting about 2005, these Maya communities in the part of Belize called the Toledo District organized under the Toledo Alcaldes Association and the Maya Leaders Alliance, took the government to court in an effort to have their traditional governance structures recognized. There were multiple steps in the process, more than I can get into here, but eventually the case came to the highest court in the land, which is actually a multilateral institution called the Caribbean Court of Justice. In 2015, the Caribbean Court of Justice issued what they called a consent order on the Maya land rights case brought before it. This was an historic ruling for Belize and surrounding regions. It recognized the traditional land rights of the 39 Mopan and Kekchi communities of Southern Belize. These communities had been managing their territories for generations. The 2015 consent order reaffirms their collective legal rights over their lands. Our guests today know this struggle inside and out. We'll talk with them about how indigenous rights and biodiversity conservation relate to one another and where the struggle to protect both stands in Belize today. Christina Koch is Executive Director for the Julian Cho Society and a spokesperson for the Toledo Alcaldes Association and the Maya Leaders Alliance. Christina is herself a Kekchi woman from Southern Belize. She helped lead the Maya land rights litigation since 2005 and was instrumental in achieving the legal victories I just spoke about. So welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, Christina, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Peter. It is a pleasure to uh, participate and to be a part of this very important podcast. Dr. Filiberto Panados is chair of the Julian Show Society and a Maya activist scholar from Sukkot's village in the north of Belize. His work focuses on indigenous education, development, and future making. He's held faculty positions at universities in Belize and has also been adjunct faculty at the University of Toronto and the University of Manitoba here in Canada. Filiberto is also founding advisor at the Center for Engaged Learning Abroad, or CELA. And I first met Filiberto in this role with CELA when he set up a community service learning course uh, for Carleton University undergraduate students to work with the Mopan and Kekchi communities in the south of Belize. 
I taught that course in the spring of 2019, which feels like a long time ago. And that's when I got to know Filiberto, uh, Cristina, and members of the Laguna and Aguacate communities in Toledo district of Belize. In fact, they really taught the course and I, I went along for the ride and learned a lot from it. Uh, Filiberto and I also played a bit of music together when I was in Belize with the Carleton students and my family. And so I'm so pleased to also have Filiberto with us today. Welcome to the podcast, Filiberto. Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here and to continue some of the conversations I think that we have had in, informally in other settings. Super. Uh, well, I'm going to start with you, Filiberto. I, I wonder if you can tell me a bit about this relationship between Indigenous rights and environmental conversation in broad terms. What does this look like for Indigenous people of Belize in general, which include the Garifuna and the Yucatec Maya that you're part of? And then maybe what does it look like in the case of the Mopan and Kekchi of Southern Belize in particular? Um, well, let me start by saying that, you know, often Indigenous struggles are casted in the language of rights, which uh, certainly has to do with rights, but I think it's much broader than that, that ultimately indigenous struggles are struggles for indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous ways of being, indigenous ways of doing, is the struggle for the affirmation of life uh, thought very broadly. Um, and in that sense, I think there's a, there's a lot in the question that you posed. You know, in, in a sense, indigenous struggles are a struggle also, not only for life, but against uh, that which is not an affirmation of life. In the words of indigenous peoples in South America, for example, what they argue is that we are in a crisis of civilization that essentially that the system that we are living in is in crisis um, in the sense that you know it is leading us to tremendous environmental destruction and we don't need to go into that but we, we all are aware of the great challenges that we have that and there that life is under threat and also in terms of the uh, social realities, the level of exclusion that there is, and also the level of the, the self, you know, in terms of uh, well-being and health, both mentally, spiritually, and physically, I think are all under threat. So essentially, it is a struggle against a system that tends to view nature as nothing but material to be exploited, to be controlled, rather than seeing nature as alive and seeing ourselves as part of that. Uh, a system that tends to see the individual as, you know, being really uh, selfish and uh, seeking others to maximize interests and as an individual that owes nothing to nobody, uh, contrasted with a sense of the self in community that indigenous kind of uh, talk, people talk about. And so in a sense, it is a struggle then for this indigenous ways of knowing, doing, being, which sees itself as in community, which sees uh, the land as alive, as us being part of that, as being dependent on and caring for the, the land. So in that sense, I think indigenous rights potentially has a lot to do with environmental or biodiversity conservation in that the goal of biodiversity conservation can be the affirmation of life as well, that it is about conserving biodiversity. And I say it can be because uh, I think that in some ways it is, but sometimes also conservation tends to be thought of within that old system, which is about the preserving of resources to be exploited for, you know, goods and services that are going to be sold to the market. And in that sense, still operating from that old system and can come into conflict sometimes with indigenous peoples as well. Uh, when, for example, parks are set up without consulting indigenous people. So I guess in, in some, there's a lot that can be connected. And, and those connections are, I think, cons consistently and continuously being sort of expanded and uh, deepened. In terms of the Yucatec and Garifuna in, in Belize, the, the Yucatec and Garifuna people have um, in some ways been perhaps uh, disconnected in some ways for their own sense of self and being and the land as a result of that colonial history, and to some degree that is. And so uh, there's a need to rebuild that 
connection. And I think uh, sometimes biodiversity conservation can facilitate that process as people connect to the land and rediscover their own worldviews, their own ancestral knowledge. I think in the case of the Kekchi and uh, Mopan people in southern Belize, they have maintained a very deep and close connection with the land and um, caring for the land. In fact, they talk about themselves as being real church, which means children of the soil. And, but it embodies, that concept embodies the, the, the notion that we are from the land, that we belong to it, that we depend on it, and that we care for it. So ultimately, their struggle is about how do we sustain or strengthen our relationship with the land and by virtue of that, our relationship with each other. So I don't know, I think ultimately there's a lot that can come uh, from this, there's a lot of overlap within these two uh, struggles or these two movements, if you want. And um, I think it's something that needs to be continuously built. Thank you, uh, Filiberto. I, Ryan has commented that we ask very big questions on this podcast, and it's uh, it's sometimes difficult to bring it all down into a few minutes of an answer. So I appreciate uh, where you just took us. And I, I just want to ask one follow-up before I turn to Christina, and that's maybe just to... Uh, give the listeners a sense of uh, the day-to-day -day life of the Mopan and Kekchi communities in Southern Belize and how they interact with their environments, just to, to give, give the listeners kind of a picture of what that looks like from day to day. So I think in, in the case of, of Southern Belize, the Mopan and the Kekchi community, and, and Christina can speak to this a lot more than I, than I do. Um, but as I mentioned, there's a, there's a deep in connection with the land. I mean, there's a, still a majority of people uh, rely on subsistence farming, um, which means of working the land. Uh, and, and they do that in a collective sense, the planting of corn and beans. Uh, every year uh, that is done and people rely on that to feed themselves. And it's a collective process. There's also a lot of uh, collection of material from the rainforest, which uh, provides medicine, it provides, you know, material for building their houses, uh, it provides a space for entertainment. So life is deeply connected with the land. And in, in the connect in different kind of ways, I'm reminded of two recent con conversations with Mopan and Kekchi Maya men and women. And the women were talking about going to wash in the river and uh, that it seems like a simple sort of uh, activity, but there's a lot that happens there. It's about caring for the for the river. It's about caring for the place where they go to wash. It's about creating a space for engaging in conversation, passing on knowledge. So land, in a sense, uh, permits those kinds of social relations to be uh, an individual, but to be an individual in community. One of the things that struck me, um, because you were talking about the way that uh, the, the forests are a food source for communities, and but you also talked about uh, farming and subsistence farming. And uh, one of the things that struck me is that the way agriculture is practiced in these communities is in uh, almost what we might call agroforestry, you know, where um, the, the farms are these um, rich, biodiverse environments. Uh, they're not what we think of here in Canada as like cut all the trees down and plant rows and rows and rows of, of corn and nothing but. Um, they tend to be uh, these complex ecosystems that people find uh, food resources, building resources. So anyway, so I'm just trying to kind of e evoke in the mind of, of some of the listeners the uh, this uh, complex relation with the land that uh, you're getting to, Filiberto. And, and now I'm going to turn to you, Christina. And uh, given the, the context that Filiberto has just set up about the, the relationships between these 39 communities and their land and how they are really intertwined, I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about the importance of that 2015 uh, Caribbean Court of Justice decision for these communities that you work with through the MLA and the uh, Toledo Alcaldes Association. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's important to recognize that in the Maya land rights struggles, what we were struggling and what we're, we continue to struggle for is, is a place to be and a place to create the kind of well-being that we want for our communities. And so I, I might start by actually describing this three decade long struggle of the Maya people 
Um, it involved a long process of direct negotiations. So I say that because the court was not the first um, place that we looked to. Uh, we attempted for a long time to try to engage the state of Belize to recognize and respect our rights, our lands and resources through uh, direct friendly negotiations. Failing that, however, and having tried and attempted many times to bring resolve and redress some of these violations of our rights that were happening on our lands, we made a very difficult decision to begin to um, embark upon strategic litigation. And uh, as we all know, um, lawsuits take a very long time and are quite expensive. Um, and just understanding that the Maya communities themselves are engaging with a tool that is not a part of their own uh, customary traditions or uses. Um, this strategic lit litigation against the government of Belize by the Maya people um, culminated in what is now known as the 2015 uh, Caribbean Court of Justice Consent Order and Judgment. The highest domestic court of Belize affirmed the rights of the Maya people to our ancestral lands and obligated the government of Belize to protect our property rights uh, equal to the protection of property rights guaranteed under the constitution of Belize. Now, what is important for us is that we didn't go to the court to prove to ourselves um, that these lands belong to us or that we've used and occupied these lands for continuous generations. We went to court really to prove to the rest of the world and to the state in particular that these lands are not empty, that these forests are not empty, that there are Eche and Mopan Maya people living in these forests and surviving and building a livelihood from these lands and forests. And so this decision was really very important for the Maya people. You know, it made it clear that we have had continuous use and occupation of these lands. We rely on these lands as, as Filiberto has already described in somewhat of um, what you might describe as an umbilical relationship to the land. Our life source is the land, land is our life. And so the way that we value land, the way that we use the land is uh, very different from uh, the majority of the outside understanding of land. Land is not a commodity for Maya people. Land is the source of our existence. Um, that, that includes our physical, uh, uh, spiritual, and uh, uh, social existence. And so this decision was really uh, very historic. It was very important. And, and it certainly was um, a turning point for the state of Belize in the full and effective recognition of the rights of the Maya people. One of the things that I found very interesting about the uh, consent order is that the Caribbean Court of Justice said that they wanted to be kept in the loop uh, as the state, together with uh, the Maya people, uh, let, implemented the consent order. And it, it kind of looked like they just wanted to be looking over the shoulder to make sure things are happening. And I found it fascinating in the last couple of weeks as I prepared for this interview that I can go on YouTube and see uh, videos of their meetings in the context of COVID. They're meeting through Zoom like we are today. And uh, <clears throat> members of the court uh, hearing from lawyers, from the communities, from your organizations, as well as from the government about the status of implementation. And I wonder if you can tell me, has the government been moving on the 2015 decision? What's the status of where that's all sits today? I think that um, it's important to note that the implementation of the Caribbean Court of Justice's decision is perhaps only the beginning of the struggle. Um, the, while the litigation was uh, quite long and uh, required a lot of continuous organizing and uh, efforts on the part of the Maya people, the implementation is perhaps the most difficult. We are now six years post decision and uh, the progress has been painstakingly slow. The government of Belize is the same government who for years and years have denied the Maya people's uh, rights and have denied the recognition of the Maya people's rights to lands and resources. And so it's not surprising that they have made every attempt to delay the implementation 
um, we have tried uh, to come to some agreement on a roadmap for implementation. And this, this has taken a long time. We have encouraged the government of Belize, uh, again, uh, with the important uh, supervision of the Caribbean Court of Justice to employ experts to help them to really realize the implementation of the Caribbean Court of Justice's judgment. The judgment says three things. Uh, simply put, it says that the government is obligated to clearly identify, delimit, and demarcate the territory of the Maya people. Uh, the question has always been, okay, so we know that the Maya people have rights to these lands, but where are those lands? What is the, um, the extent of the use of those lands? And so being able to identify by way of uh, auto-delimiting uh, and ultimately demarcating and entitling is critical. That was the first obligation that the court uh, gave to the government of Belize. The second involved the need to develop um, some kind of legal mechanism to protect these rights that are found in this place that has been identified as the ancestral lands of the Maya people. And, and then the third uh, was that the government has to seize and desist from granting any further development concessions, whether that be selling lands to private interests, whether that be permitting uh, logging concessions, oil development concessions, or any development concessions on Maya people's lands without their free prior informed consent, um, the, go the government is obligated to cease and desist. Now, the reality, however, is that the government continues to make excuses for not being able to uh, clearly define uh, the territories of the Maya people. The Maya people themselves are prepared to tell the government where their use and occupation um, uh, resides. At the same time, the government continues to grant permits to third party interests and the incursions on Maya land continue to escalate. And so we are very happy that the Caribbean Court of Justice decided to maintain supervision of this very important decision. And it has been very helpful as we continue to report on non-compliance or we continue to report on you know, the delays that have really frustrated the Maya communities. And so we have seen where the court has really played a very important role in helping to uh, bring the two parties together and also helping to ensure that the implementation is, is progressing. Um, one way that they have done that, for instance, is that the court seeing the the amount of incursions that we were reporting, um, despite their ruling, um, the court decided that they would assist the government of Belize and the Maya parties to develop a grievance redress framework, which is a, a way in which we could come and provide our complaints as to the incursions and allow for these incursions to be investigated. Um, they instituted an authority, for instance, that would investigate these complaints that would make firm recommendations as to how to resolve some of these violations. And so that has been very useful as we have progressed in the implementation. Six years later, we are now faced with a new government, a new administration, um, and uh, they have asked for some time. They seem to take the position that they are, that they will prove that they have the political will to, to implement this decision and that they believe that the Maya people have waited uh, far too long um, to see the effective uh, implementation of the court's order. At the same time, um, we are cognizant of the fact that the Maya people uh, have always recognized that the true defense of our rights to our lands and resources, the true realization of that will come from the Maya people themselves. We, we know that the implementation is going to take some time. Uh, we know that um, the Maya people will have to be very creative in creating laws uh, that will protect our rights. Uh, but more than that, that will also give meaning uh, and make right the wrongs that the Maya people have suffered for countless generations now. And so we know that it's not going to be easy. Um, and we, we were already seeing how difficult it is, but at the same time, we know that it is a struggle for our life and um, 
we have struggled for the last three decades and we are prepared to continue to, to struggle to see good, uh, the protection of our lives, the protection of our, of our ability to, to be Maya on the land that, that we were born and in the land that our ancestors have left for us. Christina, what you've just described in terms of six years of waiting for movement on implementation from the state is uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm discouraged. I'm sure it is very discouraging for the communities uh, that you work with. On the other hand, you also uh, say that the new government just elected in late 2020 uh, is making overtures to say that they are going to take this on and make this right. And I I do hope that that uh, is carried forward. Um, what I also really hear in your voice, though, is um, that this is a question of self-determination, not only a question of self-determination, it's the practice of self-determination uh, for these communities. And uh, it really sounds like you are collectively approaching it from that perspective, saying this is what we want, this is our lives and our livelihoods, and we will move forward. And we want to bring the state and with the support of the Caribbean Court of Justice to help us achieve our self-determination, but it is ultimately about the self-determination of these communities. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask you a, a, a quick question about that, because this, this isn't only about um, recognizing the, the, the limits of territories and the traditional uses of territories, but I think it's also about acknowledging the governance structures of these Maya communities. Can you say a little bit more about that? How are the communities traditionally governed and how is that part of um, the collective rights that have been uh, reaffirmed through this uh, consent order? You, you are absolutely correct. The Maya people are often seen as a people who, you know, are not a part of the mainstream, don't have the necessary know-how uh, to manage or govern their lands and are often painted in such a portrait. And it's important to recognize that our customary system of governance continues to, to be alive and well and continue to be practiced. Um, in our communities, we have our traditional governance system is uh, known as the Alcalde system where every one of our communities elect to serve for two years, uh, the leadership of our community an Alcalde and a deputy Alcalde. And while the word alcalde is a borrowed word uh, from the Spanish, it really in our language, it is the holomil kalebal or the in Mopan Maya, it is the polilka. And what it really means in our language is the person who opens the path, the person who leads on the path. And uh, if you think about uh, how we traverse in the rainforest, when we follow as someone opens and clears, makes a clearing in the forest, um, it's important to recognize that the leadership of the Maya people, the Alcalde, they describe themselves as the eyes, the ears, the mouth of the community. In other words, they are not the people making decisions for the community. They are not, uh, they're not even considering their own individualism or self-interest in any of the leadership decisions that they make for the communities. Rather, it's important to recognize that the fundamental authority for decision-making rests with the community itself. And the process by which decisions are made in Maya communities is through the abink, which is the community meeting. Uh, the abink itself, the word abink itself, describes uh, the ability to listen, to listen to each other. And so it's not so much a space where you go to make necessarily recommendations, but to listen to each other, to consider uh, the thoughts, the ideas, the things that are being put before you, uh, and to be able to generate consensus from the majority of the community. This system is still alive and well. The governance system of the Maya people also speaks very directly to how land is used. Um, in many regards, the outside doesn't understand and uh, failing to recognize that there are customary decisions that have been made. For instance, in the Maya communities, there are areas that are designated and left for the harvesting of building materials for homes. And often you will see um, decisions taken by the communities to say, well, we have elders and we want to make sure that there is a, an area that's close enough for them to access for their housing materials. The younger people will have to go farther 
to allow for this space to be available to the elders. And decisions like that, governance decisions, um, management decisions of lands, forests, and resources uh, are very much a part of the Maya traditional government systems. That is very important to us. This is why we emphasize, at least in the cases that we have brought forward to the Caribbean Court of Justice and, and, and to the lower courts in Belize, we emphasize the importance of international law and in particular, the United Nations Declaration for the very reason that we believe that the Maya people have to be um, the ones to make their own decisions using their own ways. We must all understand fully what we are deciding on in our own languages, for instance. We must be responsible for our lands and resources. And we must be able to create the opportunities for our people based on our own priorities and on our own uh, time. It is the experience of the Maya people that the state continuously tries to weaken this ability. And so our self-determination really rests and resides within the collective existence of our people on the traditional territories that we are fighting for. This is very important for us to preserve. Uh, it is important for us to recognize. We have seen where the state has denied the recognition of the governance system of the Maya people. In fact, uh, the first time we went to court, the state position was that the Alcaldes Association, which is the association of all our traditional leaders, does not have standing to bring this case before the Caribbean Court of Justice. Today, the same can be said. We have seen time and time again where government uh, representatives have questioned um, the legitimacy of our traditional uh, governance system. In fact, even to the point of saying, we will go directly to the villages, we, we don't have to speak to your alcaldes. And the communities have returned them to say, no, that is not our way. We have our system of governance, it must be recognized. We have then grounded our struggle in the consistent application of uh, international law like the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People because it helps to create a space uh, for the Maya people to really um, push for mutual, mutual respect and partnership, including the recognition of our traditional governance systems. Many of our listeners are uh, political science students, and I think uh, <clears throat> what you've just been describing in terms of the uh, uh, traditional governance structure of the alcaldes um, as well as the, the the collective rights that are uh, that were sought to be protected under this case, um, I think political science students in the the global north sometimes need to be reminded. I think that there are other ways of thinking about how to organize societies and and govern resources, and uh, some that have stood the test of time. And uh, that's certainly uh, the case for uh, what we've seen in the the Maya communities of uh, of Belize. I'd like to turn to Filiberto now. Uh, you know, Christina was just uh, in a lot of what she talked about, it's clear that international links and international declarations, the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People, for example, figure importantly in how the Maya of Belize are talking about their rights and their governance structures and what they want to protect today vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state. Um, the multilateral uh, institution of the Caribbean Court of Justice has also played an instrumental role in uh, moving these cases along and hopefully ultimately uh, bringing about implementation. Uh, Filiberto, a lot of your work is also about international relationships um, with universities. Uh, I mentioned that uh, you had our students from Carleton come down and work with uh, two of these 39 uh, communities in the south of Belize. Uh, I'm curious to hear why, um, why are those international links important for what we've been talking about today? Sure. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, the international relationships are important, extremely important, I would say. You know, uh, of late, we have been talking about indigenous resurgence as something that is happening globally. And sometimes the expression uh, might suggest that indigenous peoples are resurging from maybe some deep sleep or inaction um, when that is not the, the case. Indigenous peoples throughout the world and certainly in the Americas have consistently struggled to 
protect their land, to protect their ways of life, and to carve a space for their for their future, for their for their well being. But I think what resurgence uh, communicates, or what is new, is that what we have seen is that no longer indigenous peoples struggle in their own little spaces, okay, where a community might be fighting a landowner or a particular state or you know some actor in their own little space. What has happened is we've seen the interconnection of these little struggles throughout, and that has come as a result of precisely what we're talking about, international uh, relations. In, in fact, the indigenous resurgence movement that international scene sort of happened around the discussions of the ILO Convention 169 or just prior to that when indigenous people were being brought together. So in the first instance, I think it is important for indigenous rights activists in that they're able to learn from each other, they're able to build solidarity networks, and they're able to also struggle with the bigger system, because ultimately, while the Maya people in Belize may be struggling with the state of Belize and incursions in their land, that is not an isolated uh, situation. Uh, the companies that are, are trying to exploit for oil and forest uh, products in Toledo are from other parts of the world. And sometimes these very companies are acting also in other spaces. The fact that the state allows for these things to happen is not different here than, say, in Brazil. So there's, there's a lot of commonality. So on the one level, I think the, the international relations among indigenous rights activists is extremely important in that sense. And it has produced some very important results, such as the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the ILO Convention 169, the uh, Article 8J on the Biodiversity uh, Conservation um, of biodiversity and many other international instruments that then have an application at the local level. So there's a constant interaction between the local and the international in, in, in that way. In terms of the civil societies, again, I think I had started by saying that the struggle of indigenous peoples is for the formation of life and against a system, uh, trying to create a system that moves us away from one that's not a firm life. And I think civil societies across the world are kind of doing the same thing. So being able to build uh, solidarity networks there are extremely important. Uh, the struggle of Maya people are connected to the struggles of people in Belize and even though that's within the, the nation, but also connected to struggles in the US and uh, Canada and Brazil and Mexico and so on. So those networks are important. I think we saw in the case of the Zapatistas in Mexico where civil society was important in terms of providing a level of protection uh, of the Zapatista movement at the beginning. And so it also is true for activists in smaller countries like Belize that people know that Cristina Koch and that Pablo Mez, you know, is engaging in struggle. It's, 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 they're visible in, in international eyes. So it offers also a level of protection, you know, because activists are often under threat, violent threat, uh, that is. And then in terms of the Universities, you know, universities are about the production and the transmission of knowledge. And in a sense, they are training those people that eventually go and occupy positions of authority, either in knowledge production or, you know, the states and organizations. And so, in a sense, it's important, I think, that, that the relationship exists with indigenous peoples. And I think for indigenous people do have an interest in connecting with universities, in helping to introduce and expose to young people, that's just as you explained about the political scientists, uh, science students in, in that you're referring to, that it's important that they are able to see these other ways of knowing, okay, other forms of governance that are, that are valid, but then in a sense, because of the dominant way of thinking and the dominance of Western science, uh, the canons of knowledge of Western society, it, it prevents us from seeing these other things that are so necessary to respond to the challenges of the present. It's also important, obviously, because uh, it, universities do have a lot of uh, intellectual and material resources, and, um, and they can help to address the challenges that are being faced by indigenous peoples. There's a possibility also of learning uh, together. In fact, I would say that universities have a responsibility of contributing to solving, you know, the, the real uh, problems. And so the importance of service learning, of engaged scholarship that is, you know, it's becoming much more common. So I think international relationships in that sense are extremely important 
important because the struggle that Maya people are engaged in Toledo is connected to everybody's struggle. Right? The struggles for a better world, for a different world, or as the Zapatista put it, you know, a world where many worlds can fit. It's connected to all of that. And I think we're all struggling for that in one way or another. So it allows us to build uh, solidarity and to learn from each other and to support each other. Christina, when I was with a, a group of students in uh, Toledo, I was struck by how generous the community was uh, towards us. Um, and I was amazed at, at the time you gave them and, the, and students will be listening to this who uh, feel like these are struggles. <laughs> the way Filiberto just put it, this is a struggle for all of us and they want to contribute. And I, I'm curious, you know, over the, the three decades of struggle, you've engaged with a lot of students from around the world and, and professors and so on in uh, work alongside your campaign. And I just wonder if you can give some, you know, practical, ex tangible examples of how these relationships with uh, students and universities in the North might get, uh, lead to uh, tangible benefits to the kind of work you've been doing. Friends of the Maya people have, have been very important to this struggle. One of the reasons that we have been able to maintain our community's uh, struggle is our reliance on many international partners that have given endless hours of their time, you know, their energy and their important research efforts to support our, our efforts on, on the ground. Uh, perhaps the only way that I can describe it is that the Maya people have always been a, a very uh, community oriented people. Uh, community cohesion is very important to our, our existence as Maya people. And perhaps that is, that is evident in the way that we uh, collectively use land, the way that we collectively labor to build our homes, to plant our fields. And so it is not foreign for us to really continue to build community even outside of our uh, direct village relationships. And so when visitors come, when students come, for us, it is very important for them to learn and to have an understanding and appreciation of our struggle and of our ways of living um, in our communities. And so we're very, um, yes, generous in sharing that, uh, but we also recognize as, as Filiberto um, clearly put it, many of the students that have come to work with us, whether they have come as interns, whether they have come as volunteers or as student researchers, these various students have gone back and have become professionals in their respective fields. We have um, students, for instance, that are now working at the United Nations. We have people that are working now at the World Bank who have a deeper consciousness of indigenous realities and can understand the complexities uh, when you're working in indigenous communities. Uh, we have students that have returned to the Maya lands and have said, look, I want to continue to see how I can stay involved, how I can be more supportive. Um, and we have scholars now that are sending us more students to help. I, I can tell you that, um, for instance, when we were building the lawsuit, we were very privileged to have uh, law students come and, and while it was a lot of work, they, they spent endless hours helping to put affidavits together, helping to, to organize our documents, our files, and sometimes really uh, helping to do even the logistics and the, the coordination of uh, various uh, efforts to mobilize our communities as we went to court. And I think these students um, took from that experience uh, quite a lot. It, it certainly, we've heard back from a lot of students, say it's a life-changing event. We've learned so much from the from the process, um, but it's a it's mutual because we've also learned a lot from our students, recognizing that um, some of the misunderstandings, some of the the attitudes and perception towards indigenous peoples and their struggles for land and other rights, uh, comes because there has been a, a a level of ignorance as to the reality as to you know, how these, how, how Maya people live or how indigenous people live on their lands. And I think that having these experiences helps to bring about a more, uh, a broader global consciousness around indigenous people's ways of being and uh, around their own struggles. And so ultimately, I, I believe, and I continue to hold true to this belief that 
what we are struggling for is for a more just world. And the more of us in this world that can understand and appreciate um, indigenous people's struggle, the closer we are to achieving this goal. Time goes so quickly when we do these podcasts. I and and I feel like you just brought us full circle, Christina. When Filiberto started, I asked him about this, the relationship between indigenous rights and conservation, and uh, very quickly he brought it to the point that this is a collective struggle for uh, for survival, for a, a just and a life giving world, and how. And then we we really honed in on the the case of the Maya of, uh, of Toledo district in Southern Belize and how this is a microcosm of, uh, of, a, of a global struggle of indigenous peoples to have their, um, their practices, their relationship with the land and with each other and their governance structures uh, recognized by their states and recognized internationally and valued. And so that they can continue with that. And there's, you know, despite many years of, of heel dragging by the state in Belize. Uh, let's continue to, uh, to put, our, put hope and action into making these things a reality. Um, and, but then you then brought it back, uh, Christina, to the idea that this is uh, a, a global struggle. And both of you have talked about how important it is for people with uh, social justice values who want to see the environment protected, who uh, believe that indigenous rights uh, and uh, practices need to be recognized, can work with you and your people um, to, to further your struggle and through that to uh, support the collective struggle for, for survival and a, and a just and healthy planet. So, well, thank you both for joining us today, Christina Koch and Filiberto Panados. And as a reminder, this podcast is made available under a Creative Commons License 2.0 please share it and use it widely. We just ask that you provide appropriate attribution and you don't make modifications to the podcast. Please follow us on Twitter at EcopoliticsP. You can get in touch through our website, ecopoliticspodcast.ca. The Global Ecopolitics Podcast is produced by Nicole Bedford. Support with transcription and captioning is provided by Kika Mueller. And Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. So thanks everyone and stay tuned.